Welcome back to the Cult House Podcast. I'm your host, the scholar of spite and the Saturday Night Delight, Roger Riddell. Joining me today, he is the frontman of Los Angeles industrial metal staple Society One. He's a producer, director, and photographer who has worked with the likes of DMC, John Five, Wednesday 13, Zach Wilde, and Dope. And he is a former adult film director, the slacker Jesus porn king himself, Matt Zane. How are you doing today, Matt? Oh, thank you. That's quite the intro. Every time I hear uh, somebody intro the things that I've actually done in life, I don't even believe it myself. It just it seems like it's a made up story of some sort. Yeah, no, I was uh, I was just thinking earlier today, you were actually the first person that I ever interviewed when I was in college, but it was via MySpace. Uh, wow. I had this English class that I had to create a zine for uh, when I was at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. And uh I just sent you like a bunch of questions via MySpace and you sent them back uh, maybe like a day or so later. This was like a few months after the Sound That Ends creation came out and uh, a little bit after y'all did download. Yeah, wow, that, that was a while ago. Um, and it was so funny because before we just went on to your show officially, um, we were talking about like the, the, the difference in interviews now versus back then. Those were... <laughs> you know, where everything is now more like in terms of actual video. So it's more like a, all the interviews or talk shows, whereas in, in the past, um, it was it was all like written and stuff like that. Yeah, and it's crazy because like uh, looking back now, like I was just a dumb college kid then. I would never do an interview just like totally written over email because it's just like um, it's one of those things where you kind of lose some of the character of it all. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I I think like all the old school interviews were cool. Like I, I, I obviously came from the days where people still read interviews. And if you got, if you managed to get the magazines, you know, people read it because it, it, they were still had monetary value to it. Um, but, you know, the problem was, is that over time, like I just think people stopped reading interviews because like, they just didn't mean anything anymore. The advent of the web, because then everybody could do interviews and so on and so forth. And then this started and now everybody does this. And now you get a lot more of the actual inflection of the guy's speech and, and the attitude and, you know, the sarcasm or whatever. So I, I think now it's like much cooler as long as you can figure out how to connect to whatever medium that you're trying to, uh, to do the interview on that I'm, that I'm all for it. So I think it's really cool, but it's really cool that I'm glad to hear that we did that, that interview that, that I wasn't some dick that was like, Oh, you're in college. I'm not going to do your interview. So you know, I'm genuinely a nice guy because I was much more famous back then than I am now. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was always surprising to me back then that uh, you were so open uh, to to talking just via MySpace because uh, I think I used to bug you and uh, maybe every now and then Dirt uh, through uh, through MySpace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another guy that would that used to talk to anybody and everybody. But yeah, um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you today is because you uh, recently put together a documentary about Dirt. Uh, you know, unfortunately, he passed earlier this year, and uh, I had a chance to watch The Altered Noise last night, and uh, it was a really touching and well-done tribute to him. Uh, it kind of, uh, um, I never got the chance to meet him in person, but after watching the documentary, I felt like I knew who he was like a lot better than just like, you know, who's the basis for, for society one. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to, to think about and to talk about, but, um, you know, obviously this, this latest round of interviews have been because of the, the movie, the altered noise about her. And my main goal with the film I mean, there was a, there was a couple different ones, but I, I wanted it to be enjoyable for people that didn't even know him to get to know him and people that did know him or know of what, it, what he did. I wanted to get, have people 
know him better. Like you said, you knew who he was for years and you got to know him a lot better by the end of the film. And, you know, the whole point was is to create something that also was for his family and friends whenever they were missing him and wanted to hang out with him for an hour or so, they could just put the movie on and, and really get that sense that you got to hang out with him for, for an hour or so. But that's the general idea and the, and the feedback I've been getting. I, I was on set, like I was telling you earlier, the last couple of days. And on the set I was on yesterday, I was on, I was on set with a, with a guy with, I'm sure you're very familiar with named AC Slade. And he's in the Misfits and he, Joan Jed and Dope. And he has his own coffee company. And, and we were talking a little bit uh, in between takes. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I'm really sorry to hear about Dirk. Um, and he goes, I, I didn't watch the movie for a while, but when I finally did, you know, he goes, initially he just thought, oh, it was just Matt doing a movie about his friend. But then when he watched it, he was incredibly impressed and taken aback by how much it really draws the viewer in and how much you can appreciate it and get into the movie and the storyline, even if you didn't know him or, or a big fan of his. And because it's a it's a rock and roll story, you know, it's about a kid from Indiana that loved Kiss that ultimately moved out to L.A. and seven months later is touring the world and then ultimately even got to meet and hang out with Gene Simmons, his hero. So um, it's just one of those those feel good overall stories that I promised him I would make when he was still with us. And I ultimately just uh, jumped right in and just, I got it knocked out in four months after, after he passed and debuted it. And now it's uh, actually made it to a film festival, uh, October 30th. Yeah. And uh, what was your initial introduction to him? Like, cause I, I had kind of known of him uh, before that, because he had been in a, a side project that Preston Nash had uh, when he had been in Primer 55. Uh, and then I guess maybe like a year after, uh, you know, I heard of him through Preston's band, he uh, debuted with you guys at the first suspension show out in uh, LA. Yeah, yeah. Um, we found, we met Dirk, because Preston was in the band at the time. He, was, he wasn't in Dope or Primer anymore. And uh, we required a bass player uh, because for whatever reason, you know, all that stuff happens. And we just got introduced to him through, through Preston. He just came down to rehearsal at the exact moment where we had the first suspension show book at the Viper, uh, no, the Key Club, which is a club down here in L.A. And said, hey, we'll just introduce you officially on the last song. And then from that point forward, he was in the band. And two weeks after that show, I think he was on a plane to Europe with us and we were touring 17 different countries all around, all around Europe. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he went on to be, I guess, sort of the, the most consistent member of the band, uh, there for, you know, the more than a decade, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think we worked together for about 15 years total, uh, give or take a year. He, he was definitely the, the most consistent and, um, yeah, we, we worked on pretty much everything together. He was one of the only other guys in the band over the course of the years that would write songs, actually, that we'd write songs together. A song off the new album uh, called The Altered Noise is the name of the movie and the name of the song that we worked on together that's on Black Level 6, the album coming up. And he would work on the artwork and he was in all the videos. And, you know, we talk almost every day for like 15 years and obviously do the shows and tour together and, and so on and so forth. So... Yeah, we just developed a really amazing friendship over the years. And we did a lot of other projects together, too. Dirt at one point became pretty famous for doing tattoos in Hollywood and worked on some really big stars and celebrities. Um, so, yeah, you know, it was about 15 years. And then uh, and then at the end, um, uh, after our partnership pretty much ran its course, I mean, we remained friends. I, I still him in the capacity of three-headed snake when he got into that band with Sin Kieran. And, um, you know, so our friendship continued all throughout for about a total of 17 years. But as far as the band is concerned, you know, we worked consistently together for four or 15 years and all at uh, all facets of the band. It wasn't just like some hired gun or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what are some of your uh, favorite stories about Dirt uh, that just come to mind uh, anytime that you think of him? I mean, there's so many. I mean, it's just like, uh, I mean, it's just 15 years of just complete insanity because, I mean, if you ever see the movie, there's a section in the movie 
that is dedicated just to the mere fact that, like I said, the party never stopped. And that's a really good indication of what our relationship and the time creatively together, like it always was. I mean, it didn't matter if it was in the beginning of the band where, you know, we would bring him to the red light district the first time he was in, in Amsterdam and we're bringing him through the little alleyways pointing to all the girls, you know, because this kid grew up in Indiana, you know, and he's just looking out over in Amsterdam and it's all, it's like a foreign land over there or whether it would be when we were on stage together at download in front of 80,000 people making rock history or whether it was for taking photo shoots for Metal Hammer, or when we made those reality shows together about tattooing girls naked, um, all those nights and all those long nights, or the time that we were in studio together and uh, we were in these massive studios like Energy Studios with our producer Wade Norton and just spending nights in there and you know, being literally next to bands like Linkin Park and Papa Roach while they're doing their records, you know, and running, running into them in the, in the, in the lobby, you know, um, there was, uh, the times, like I talked about in the movie, when we had that mansion up in the hills and dirt would party all night long and, and all the Christmases we spent together. And it was just, uh, you know, all the crazy photo shoots and everything like that. It was just like a really wild and crazy, um, uh, time and there's just so many memories it's just hard to really pinpoint it down to like a specific a specific thing so it's just um all I can say is just you know you got to watch the movie I go over a lot of them in the movie and I'm sure over time I'm going to remember more and more as as the time goes on it's just again it's really difficult over 15 years to to really think about specific ones because there were just so many good ones yeah, yeah. I mean, I uh, I really love the story from the movie about uh, Christmas whenever your family came over and he's just like passed out in the other room the whole day from partying uh, the night before and he didn't uh, really come out until, uh, I guess, Christmas Day. He just slept all through Christmas Eve. Yeah, yeah, that's a true story and that really happened. And that picture that I show in the movie um, is actually the real picture at the dinner table that after he slept all the way through Christmas Eve and got up for Christmas Christmas dinner the next morning. So yeah, it was, it was typical dirt though. You know, those, those, those days we would, we would, he would still go off even in, towards the end. And I even mentioned in the movie, like, like forget about when we'd still go on the road and we'd go to like Las Vegas. I mean, every, every time it was just like, it was like fear and loathing in Las Vegas part two. And uh, I, it's funny because at his memorial that we threw out here, uh, one of our old drummers, Pete Pace showed up and he was telling me a story about when we were touring through Vegas with him at one point, And I went back to the room and they went, they raged 24 hours all night long. And I didn't even realize that even though I was there because I was sleeping back in the room until Pete told me. And that was another Vegas crazy tour story that I missed that I wasn't even aware of for nine years until our old drummer told us about it. So stories are still coming back to me that even happened when they were in my vicinity that, that I was unaware of. So yeah, it was just, uh, that was just dirt. You know, he was always just smiling, going crazy, just having a good time. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one of the things that's always uh, jumped out to me about you is that um, you used to be involved in the adult film industry and it's kind of like uh, your family business for like lack of a better term, because your dad was a director, your brother. Yeah, he was a, a producer. He was, he, yeah. was, he was actually a company owner. He wasn't even a producer. Like it was. A you cut out for a little bit there. Oh, I, I was going to say, uh, he actually wasn't a uh, producer. He was a distributor. Yeah. Uh, your dad was the distributor, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I didn't know until recently that um, your cousin was uh, Rob Black, the XPW guy. Yeah. Not a lot of people know that. He's my real cousin. <laughs> like, what is it like uh, just being in that sort of family? Because um, it's, uh, it's one of those things where uh people like you know probably have certain ideas from the outside but like being on the inside it's probably not really like that much more insane than just like you know like a quote-unquote normal family i, I mean it, it's I, I wish i could tell you it was this or that or whatever but I, you know i live in la and all of them live back in new york so um I don't see that side of the family all that often and nor do I, I talk to them all that often. I mean, they, they all talk and hang out back there, but I really, I don't think I've talked to Rob in 
um, maybe, man, it could be 10 years at this point, you know, like, so it's, it's, uh, it, it's not really what you think it is. I'm kind of like the, the black sheep and kind of out on my own. I talked to my father, but that's pretty much it. Like I, that side, like they all talk to each other, but I don't really, I don't really even know what's going on like in their life. Like it's been like literally probably like a decade since I've talked to that whole side of that family. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things about all of that too is, uh, you know, as someone who moved on from the adult film industry to do other things, uh, when people do that, there's always kind of the stigma that follows them that uh, a lot of people kind of have trouble separating them from uh, their previous work in the adult film world. Uh, what has that been like from your perspective, uh, just going into like music and, uh, you know, just video production and photography and all of that? Well, I mean, I understand it because the reality is, is that like back in my day when I was in that industry, there, had only, there was only one. OK, let me rephrase that. Back when I was doing it, when I crossed over up until me, there was never anybody in the history of the adult film career to cross over into music successfully. It had never happened ever. Um, as far as the film crossover, there was one guy at that time that did it. Only one. And he, he went on and did pretty good. He went on and did some Linkin Park videos in a movie, I believe. But that was it. Out of 30 years of the industry existing and the thousands of people that were involved in it, people had tried and everybody failed. So it, was, it wasn't a thing that was viewed as possible. Reason being that a lot of people that were involved in the industry, honestly, didn't really have that much talent and enough in, intelligence or creativity or drive to be able to make it in the mainstream business and i know that's a little harsh for me to say but it's just the reality and if if that wasn't the case the more people would be able to do it you know talent is talent and regardless of what genre or industry you're in it's going to come through one way or the other and so at the time i knew that it was going to be a tough leap for me to be able to get over to that other side because People always construed everybody in that industry as a complete slacker and just a nobody and, and not really possessing any other talent than peddling flesh on whatever medium at the time it was being distributed on. But it didn't really, it really didn't seem like that big of a deal to me because I just knew that, that I had the ability to be able to, to cross over. And honestly, like now, not a lot of people even know that I used to do that anymore. It's not even something that I, that I flaunt or talk about. It's just like a, another aspect of my life that's like a past life because to me, it really isn't anything that special at all. There were some interesting experiences and memories as far as all that was concerned. But to me, it's like, it's almost like my life really started when I left that industry versus when I was in it. Because, you know, yeah, like I said, it was... It was a cool experience for being a young man and being surrounded by so many beautiful women. But I mean, if you compare it to what I've done since I left, it, it's for me, it's really hard to look at it even in, in the same level or on the same or in the same way. Because, I mean, if you had to give me a choice, oh, Matt, would, would you like to have the credit of shooting the doors at the 50th anniversary or shooting this adult movie? Would you want to perform in front of 80,000 people and make rock history suspended or shooting this adult movie? Would you want to break the world record in suspension for six hours or shoot this adult movie? Would you want to work with Zach Wilde or DMC or shoot this movie? Would you want to produce a track with DMC from Run DMC and play on it? Or, you know, X, and I could just go down the line. So, you know, for me, it's not really like, um, it's not really like a, a, even a, a thing. Like, I, it's just... It's just something that I did that it's just I happened to start there and then I just I worked over and 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 worked to a different level and a different place in, in my in my career. What was it like getting to shoot the Doors 50th anniversary? Because I know that uh, Jim Morrison's one of your biggest influences. And one of the things that's always kind of stuck out to me about Society One as well is that uh, among that sort of industrial metal uh, movement uh, from the early 2000s, you guys had a little bit of like, I guess for lack of a better term, like a cock rock influence uh, that bled through into 
into what you all did as well that kind of made you stick out. Uh, and I've always kind of assumed that some of that probably came from that Jim Morrison influence as well. Yeah, you know, I could talk about the Doors and about Jim Morrison uh, forever, and I have some really cool stories regarding the band and all, and all that. And I think some of the other cock rock influence probably came from Van Halen, because for me, growing up in the 80s, it was, it was all about Van Halen and the Doors, pretty much. And believe it or not, prior to that, it was all about Run DMC, but that's a whole other story. Um, so, yeah, the, the situation with shooting that was amazing, that they used actually 13 of my photos with that, which I believe was even more than the guy that came from Rolling Stone. And John Densmore actually ended up, the drummer for The Doors, ended up using it for his private page as well. But I got to tell you, it was a crazy day to wake up and then everybody's blowing up my phone because uh, on Facebook, they were like, The Doors tag, Matt Zane, you know, and and it was just like, wow. And it just kept happening like 13 times over the course of the day. And they ended up using the photos for like all these magazines and whatever. But that really wasn't the only time that, that I shot them. I mean, that was an amazing thing to be there and be down in Venice at that time for the 50th anniversary. And I was front row because, you know, obviously I was shooting it. But, you know, I, I've been able to, to photograph Robbie Krieger multiple times and uh, meet him and, and be backstage and have multiple pictures on the majority of those shows. And I even managed to film John Densmore for a unrelated uh, project and actually go over to his house and talk to him about Jim Morrison in his living room and and um, just, you know, get to hang out with him a little bit after the interview as well. You know, an incredible individual and really both of them very, very kind because these guys are legends and they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars and I'm a complete nobody compared to them and for them to be able to take the time and talk to me and they even gave me their emails, believe it or not, you know, <laughs> so I could, you know, and I don't abuse it. I don't e email them all that often, but uh, yeah, it's just a, uh, it's a really wild thing. You know, you, you always think about Jim Morrison and about the doors. And then one day you're just sitting in John Densmore living room, talking about Jim Morrison with the guy actually in the doors. And um, it was the same thing with Robbie Krieger. I was explaining to him and talking to him about the solo that he did and when the music's over. And, and we were kind of discussing about the musical context of when it came out. But instead of me just talking about it with somebody else, I'm actually talking about it with the guy that did the solo. And you want to talk about mind blowing moments and talk about just experiences that you never would think that you'd have as a 16 year old kid. It's just it's not even. Um, I, I, I'm telling you this and I can't even really fathom it. It's, it just doesn't even seem real to me that I could like, you know, that I had these conversations or I could literally get on my computer and email them. I'm not saying they'd, they'd email me back because they don't all the time and sometimes they do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a wild thing. And on a side note, uh, you know, I even got to go to Jim Morrison's grave in Paris during one of my press tours and this was before they put the gates up around his gravestone. So I was one of the last few people to actually be able to go to his grave and touch it and spend time actually on his grave. And you can't even get within 25 feet of it now because there's, there's big uh, fences around it. So, yeah, I've been very blessed to be able to meet and, and talk to and, and kind of work with and capture one of my biggest and favorite band ever. And, um, you know, a lot, not a lot of people can say that. And, and luckily, I've even been, I've managed to be able to meet David Lee Roth as well in the Rainbow one night. But I, I unfortunately never got to work with him. And now, you know, he's obviously retiring after his last couple shows in Vegas. So that's uh, something that I, I'm, I'm happy I got to meet, but I never got to work with him. And I really believe that I would because I've, I've worked with so many of my heroes like The Doors and I got to work with DMC. And DMC was like my favorite guy, him and, you know, Michael Jackson. Jackson uh, at the same time that I was listening to, to Van Halen. So I really believe that I'd ultimately work for him because I also worked for John Five a lot and he had a, he had a connection to him, but that doesn't look like it's going to happen. But I am going to go to Vegas and see one of the last shows uh, in, in January. Yeah, yeah. And it's uh, it's always cool to hear that someone met their uh, met and worked with their heroes and uh, their heroes kind of lived up to to the expectation, too. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the, I have zero disappointments. I also got to meet Ray Manzarek from The Doors. We never got to work together. He passed away prior to us being able to work together, which is unfortunate. Um, and it's weird because at the time I did give him my spoken word record when I met him and he did listen to it and we did talk, but I really wasn't that, not that I was ever really famous, but I was definitely more famous later in life after meeting him. So we never really got to connect on that level, which is kind of unfortunate, especially because ultimately I ended up meeting his drummer, Ty Dennis, and working with Ty Dennis. 
We did a Zeppelin cover uh, early earlier in the pandemic. So I think I would have ultimately been able to do that. But, you know, I got to meet him, obviously, John Densmore, Robbie Krieger. Um, and then I got to work with DMC, which was was ridiculous, like unbelievably ridiculous, because, again, that was a guy in, you know, my junior high that I'm getting Raising Hell and King of Rock and listening to Run DMC incessantly back then. And it was just just ridiculous. Like the first time I heard his voice come through the speakers on one of the tracks that I produced for us, I, I almost started crying. I mean, it was just ridiculous. The funny thing was, is that I worked with him prior to that when I shot the video for Noise Revolution for him and Wayne Static. Wayne Static is the guy that introduced him and I. So I already thought it was a big deal when I got to shoot the video. The fact that I got to produce a couple tracks after that was was like icing on the cake. But all of that was thanks to Wayne Static. Yeah, and uh, DMC is one of those guys who, uh, when I sit back and think about it, he's just like insanely talented beyond just music. Because I've seen him at Comic Cons promoting, you know, like comic books that he's that he's worked on. You know, that guy is so cool and so nice. Like, I in 2020, prior to the pandemic, I'm literally watching him on the Grammys, and he's with on the Grammys with Aerosmith, and I text him afterwards, and I'm like, dude, great job, you, you killed it, and he texts me back. You know, like after I shot the, the video for Noise Revolution, he hit me up at Christmas and wished me a Merry Christmas. Yeah, so, and, and, uh, the guy's a super legend, man. You know, like I, <laughs> it's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So to be that cool to somebody like me, because, again, comparatively, you know, I'm, I'm a nobody compared to these guys, you know. So to be able to have this interaction and, and these things with them is just, um, you know, it's just it's, it's really amazing. And I'm glad that I can come on an interview and go forth in life and tell people like you and other people. Yeah, these people are really amazing, awesome people that 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 were really great to be able to meet and, and sometimes in some cases work with. And Zach Wilde's another one. He's an he was an amazing, awesome, super cool dude to be able to sit on set with and hear stories. And not only that, he's a man of his word, because when we were done working on this one commercial thing that we did for him, he's like, Matt, I'm going to use you for future projects. And I, I shortly after that, I got a call to go on tour with him and I couldn't go because I was too booked up with other projects. So obviously working relationship wise, uh, we fell out, but still he, you know, cause he probably figured, well, if, you know, I offered him a gig and he, he couldn't do it. So he's probably too busy, but he even kept his word too. He was amazing to work with on set. And told great stories about him and Dimebag and the whole bit. But then later even kept his word and called me later to even get more into his camp and work for him. And unfortunately, I couldn't do it. But that was my fault. That wasn't his. He he upheld his word. So there's a lot of like really cool stories like that of like awesome people. And, and that's another one. And that's another guy that was just like, holy crap. You know what I mean? Because I tend to really look up to guys that were the generation above me and beyond. Because the guys that I meet in my generation... Or we're, we have a little bit more uh, friendship basis versus like like hero worship, you know, not that I wasn't a fan of people like Wayne Static, because I definitely was. And we talked about it. But, you know, Wayne and I, you know, we knew each other from the, the, the days on the Sunset Strip. You know what I mean? Whereas Zach Wilde to me was when I was still living back in New York, he was already Ozzy Osbourne's, you know, guitar player. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I love that um, as much as he looks like this big, tough biker guy he has this sense of humor about himself and they always make sure that they convey that in a lot of their music videos too. Yeah. You know, I wish I got to work with them more, but, but uh, nevertheless, you know, like I said, I, I, I can't really speak highly enough about the guy. Like uh, I, I'm not even sure if he totally remembered me. I'm sure he would if, if people like reconnected us and said, Oh, this is the guy that did this so many years ago, but yeah, just a really awesome dude. I mean, it was a real, it was a really amazing pleasure uh, being able to work on set with him for a day and, and all that stuff. So yeah, it was just a, just another great experience. Uh, you know, I've just been incredibly blessed to work with all of the people that I've, that I've worked with and done all the things that I've done in, in that respect. And that's why, I mean, going back to the adult video thing, it's hard for me to really talk about that with anything that really, with any sense of wonder or, or a, 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 a tremendous appreciation for it, because it's just kind of like, yeah, it was crazy. It was fun. It was wild. You know, I was young, whatever. And I could think in my memory and tell you, weird insane crazy orgy stories and all these things and stories about women but it's just hard in retrospect now to like really give it too much too much validity because i mean look at these other things that i've just told you in the last 10 minutes do you know what i mean it's just like you're gonna 
you're going to try to compare these great people and these projects and these things that like these, these silly movies that I, that I made, you know, like, like 20 years ago or whatever that, you know, no, nobody cares about to, to this day. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the thing that fascinates me about that industry uh, isn't so much the industry itself, but the fact that um, a lot of people who are involved in it, when they move on to do other things, like years later, someone finds out about their involvement, like say they, they go into just like some like normal nine to five job, someone finds out that they were involved in it. And it just kind of turns their life upside down because uh, there's like a stigma to it. But you know, it's also like, this is 2021. And like, sex works a profession. Yeah, you know, I don't really think there's that much of a stigma anymore to do it. Because I mean, let's face it, like, look, like after the sex tape started coming out with like Tommy Lee, and <clears throat> Dave Navarro, another amazing, awesome human being who was in the movie, and I performed with at Wayne Stedex original memorial. Um, you know, had, had directed a movie and Wayne and Snoop Dogg directed a movie and Kim Kardashian is worth a billion dollars. And her whole start was from getting banged on film and making a private porno. And it's just, it's, I don't really think it's that big of a deal anymore. And honestly, there's been more people now that have come out of that industry and gone on to do some significant things, uh, that, that are talented. Um, so I think it's not really a thing anymore. It was definitely a thing when I was in it 20 something years ago. Uh, but now I just, I, I don't know. I see tons of girls that were in it and did things that now are, have very successful careers, whether it's in, uh, you know, uh, the industry in terms of makeup artists or, or, uh, or medical professions or whatever. I just, I don't really think it has the same impact that, that it used to. It just doesn't, it just doesn't seem like that. There's just been too many people going back and forth and, and so on and so forth. And that's again, why I don't really, you know, I'm not really like a role model, model or anything. I don't really mind talking about it, but uh, again, for me in, in my life, it was just like, great. I'm glad I did it in my twenties as a young man. And it was fun and it was amazing, but it's not something I sit around at night going, Ooh, I wish I could go back and have and relive, you know, that again. It's it's more, <laughs> you know, I, I do have those thoughts now, but now it's more of the thoughts, honestly, of thinking I wish I could go back and, and relive those tours with dirt, you know, like like that's that's a reality, you know. Like I wish we could go back to that time because it's it's not just about the mere fact of him being there, it's also about the fact of the popularity and the intensity of the band at that time. You know, I still love my band and, and my band still tours, but it's not as nearly as much as we were and we're not nearly as popular as we were. So I do think up back to the, those times and think, you know, yeah, well, I wish I wish I could go back to 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, you know, because it was it was some of the best years of my life. And it was and, you know, and Dirt was also there and he was he was there with me. But definitely not not the adult video years. I don't I don't lay awake at night going, oh, you know, uh, oh, I wish I could go back and shoot that movie again, you know, and and all that all that good stuff. Although there there were a couple times on set that that were kind of funny. I, I did a movie once where I shot literally I think forty five girls in a big lesbian orgy. And when Lynn Strait from Snot heard about it, he called me up and said, I'm coming to set. And I've got pictures somewhere of him in the middle, smiling with like 45 <laughs> girls around him. You know what I mean? And there was another time where I can't even, I'm not even allowed to really say this, but the band isn't a band anymore, so I don't mind. But like the members from No Doubt came over to my house once to watch, but not Gwen. And they're like, don't tell Gwen that we were here. You know what I mean? And, you know, and that was also the days that when I was getting invited to go down to the studio with Corn when they were doing Follow the Leader, and I used to go to, I threw Jonathan Davis's bachelor party and used to hang out with those guys a lot more and, um, and, and all that stuff. And for those that didn't know, like, if you go on Corn's biggest record, Follow the Leader, I was thanked on it. So, you know, there were, the more I think about it, there was moments here and there, but it, I, I don't, again, I don't sit up at night going, oh, I wish I could go back there. It's, it's definitely more, I wish I could go back to, those years when when Dur and I were really you know going for it and touring and on MTV and, and and doing and doing our stuff for those like four or five years. Yeah, and uh, I think when I originally heard of Society One, it was actually uh, from a friend in high school who had given me this VHS tape that was like a video magazine called Backstage Pass or something like that. Uh, and it was yeah. around the time y'all did Slacker Jesus. Yeah, Backstage Pass um, was a pg version of an adult series that i did and it was a video magazine where we had all these big bands 
that would talk about their backstage experiences like with groupies because back then groupies were cool not like now now you're gonna get like thrown in jail uh, or get hit by like the me too movement but back then groupies used to be like cool and we used to interview all these bands and man we interviewed man everybody uh lemmy el duce before he died like i think that was his last interview the guy from the mentors before he died the guys in corn orgy um kid rock uh sugar ray coal chamber guys um uh, palpa roach uh yeah it's just endless and and uh yeah, those were real successful for a while. You know, that was uh, that was a really cool thing um, that 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 happened. I have I have those somewhere. They wouldn't really do do anything now because everybody has the ability to go up on YouTube and do whatever. But back then, you know, the only way you could get media is if you had to go to the store and buy it. So the mere fact that we had the camera crews and the sound to be able to put together these magazines, but on video format, was was a very big deal because that was back when you used to have to have a camera, you know, and a sound guy, you know, and an editing software. You know, now anybody can do anything. But back then, those were uh, those were really cool. I should really find all those and, and put those together and just put them online for people to to see, because uh, it was kind of interesting. You know, we had a lot of a lot of bands before they blew up huge. Like we had Limp Bizkit, like when they had only sold five thousand records, and they ended up sending like twenty million records, like within a year after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, this past weekend, you co-directed a music video. Uh, for dope with their frontman Edsel Dope. Uh, yeah, he's a guy that uh, you know you've kind of had like a longstanding uh, relationship with uh, in the music world uh, from you know just touring with them on the Twelve Dollar Riot tour back in the day to yeah uh, he played drums uh, for you guys on Exit Through Fear. Uh, how has that relationship evolved over the years? Yeah, we've known each other for about uh, twenty years now. I think maybe more. I don't know somewhere around there. Um, yeah, Etzel's, uh, uh, he's a real intense dude. And, um, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions about him is that he is just this guy that kind of screams in the front of dope. Uh, but he actually is far more intelligent than you probably have any idea or the ability to conceive of. And that's the one thing that I tell people when they ask me about him. He is um, very driven, high energy, but very, very, very intelligent and very gifted in terms of music production. And a lot of people don't don't get that. And they're probably going to look at me and be like, you're just saying this because you guys are friends or whatever. And it's like they you really don't know what he is capable of and also what he's doing in life. He has other businesses and other ventures that are just mind blowing that are going on that are that overshadow anything I've ever done in, in the film world ever. He, he hasn't really made it public to how accomplished and successful he is yet, but I think that's going to change pretty soon in the, in the near future. He's going to go public with a little more things like that. But um, yeah, he's just a very interesting, very accomplished, successful, intelligent individual that uh, if I could tell you more about his life, you would understand why I would know this guy and work with him or work for him for, for 20 years. Um, he, if you think the people I've worked with are impressive, if you, if he opened his book and talked about who he's worked with, uh, it would, you, your head would explode. And I can't say it cause it's not for me to say, but I'll, I will tell you a story. One day we were together and he goes, Oh, look at this. And he showed me some pictures of, uh, somebody that he had just worked with for one of his companies. And let me just put it to you this way. It, 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 the music person that he showed me, it didn't get any bigger. And I yelled at him for not inviting me down to, to the production that day. And I said, dude, I would have shined your shoes just to stand next to you to work with this person. It was that big. And he's working with these people and I'm not. So like, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 he's an interesting dude. You got to know how to work with them properly, but, but, uh, it, it's the level that he's been able to attain in his life and keep it secret all these years is just, I, I can't even begin to tell you like what, what, who this guy really is. Uh, so anyways, with that aside, you know, of course you're going to want to be friends with somebody like that because they're interesting and they're doing really interesting things and they're, and he's, a, he's, he's a man of his word. So it's basically like, 
if we're doing these things or whatever, and he goes, oh, I'm doing this tour, I'm going to throw you on a week of it, you know, he's going to do it. And he does it. And that's why we've continued to tour together. And we're going out again with them in February uh, for, for six, seven, eight, nine days, something like that. So, um, yeah, you know, if you ever have the ability to, uh, to interview that guy, it's, it's definitely worth it. But you got to dig deep because his life is far more fantastic then he lets the public know. And I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that, but that's, that's the truth. You know, I've, uh, <clears throat> I've always thought that uh, he's especially smart about uh, image and knowing who his audience is and just being consistent in the way that he's presented uh, his musical output, you know, in particular. Yeah, man, again, I, I can't, uh, you know, uh, the thing is, man, is again, I, I just got to be really careful how much I give away because I have such a window into his life like so many other people don't. But if you ever spend any time in the studio with him and you could hear all the different musical projects and all the tracks that weren't released and you end that, you know, he can play multiple instruments, he can harmonize, he can sing anything. And the thing is, is I think he doesn't get a lot of credit for it because I, I really believe that the tone of his voice in a way puts people off to a certain extent that aren't into that style of music, but they don't understand that that if they were in a studio with the guy, he could sing anything. He just may not like the tone of it, but as far as he can, and he can play drums and he can play guitar and, and do, do all the electronics. So yeah. And, and then there's the, that marketing aspect of it. You know, it's just, it's, um, it's been very interesting working with them, uh, you know, for, for all these years. And again, I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think that the things that we were involved on weren't really amazing and really, really cool. But yeah, he's, He's brought me into some also some great, amazing projects. And and he single handedly is probably responsible for keeping the band at the level that it's at, because he brings us out on these tours where we're playing in front of 750 to 1500 people versus 100 people. If we were to go out on our own, you know, so, yeah, I, I, owe, I owe the guy a lot in, in that respect. And um, again, I, I really hope that for him in these next this next year, that he gets out there more and more people can realize uh, the ability and what, you know, what he's accomplished in, in his life. And um, tell me a little bit about uh, Black Level 6. Uh, when is that, uh, you know, expected to come out at this point? And uh, what's it like compared to uh, previous albums? Man, I, I could talk about Black Level 6 for the next hour. We don't even have, uh, have time. So I'll give you the quick rundown of it. Uh, it's the last album that Dirt and I did, uh, and it was an experiment album. What it was basically is we sat down and we said, hey, we got a great idea. Let's make an album like they made In Utero by Nirvana. Or that was the main album that we thought of, quite honestly. And, and what we meant by that was, is what if we go into the studio and we actually just recorded the instruments live and minor up, you know, um, edits where we need them or punch-ins like they used to do in the old days. And then we said, okay, let's take it a, another fur, a step further. What if we sing the entire album without any vocal tune or copy and pasting? What would that sound like? Would it sound like an album that was recorded in the early nineties? You know, like those, like In Utero album where they had more of a punk produ producer. And we had Greg Hetson from the Circle Jerks uh, mix the record. And I co-produced the record, the recording of it with uh, Patrick Burkholder. So, we even took it to that next level. We had very much like in utero was more of a, a punk guy. You know, we had a punk guy mix our album too. And um, it turned out to be an album that Dirt and I honestly were uh, kind of in a disagreement about it. Dirt really loves the sound of those albums and love the rawness of things. And when I was done with the record and listened back to it, I was like, man, I think it's a little too raw. To me, it sounded almost a little too much like like a demo versus an album but dirt absolutely loved it so when he was still alive i was we talked about it and i was really on the fence about how it was going to come out or if i wanted to get it produced a little differently or redo some songs or some tracks on it and ultimately when he passed away i just decided you know he really wanted this album and loved it the way that it could that, that it was so i made a compromise and what i did was is i'm going to put out the original album that dirt heard um, as it was the tracks that he heard and approved. And then I went back in and I found some leftover tracks from Black Level 6, specifically a song called As I, Di as I Die. And I went in and had that remixed. And um, 
not remix. I had it mixed more like a slicker production, just like they did on in utero, like the singles they did on that. And that's going to be the single because it's a little more radio friendly. It's that big sounding, more modern sound. Dirt and I still wrote the song together, uh, but I didn't. I figured he wouldn't mind if I had that one mixed differently because uh, he never heard that one finished anyways. That wasn't going to be on the original album. And uh, that's going to be the, the core of, of Black Level 6. So there's going to be the original album that he heard, that he approved, that was mixed and recorded the way that, that he loved. And then there's going to be this other track on there, As I Die, that is a song that we did record together during those sessions, but was mixed more commercially, I guess, in a sense, like by the more of the traditional sounding mixes. And then the physical copy is going to have three more additional bonus tracks that Dirt played on that we still have to get mixed, but that's only gonna be on the physical copy. So it's gonna be a, a pretty robust album. And we hope to get it out right before the uh, the tour of next year. Then we go out with Static X Dope and, and Fear Factory. And uh, we still gotta shoot a music video for it. We gotta finish the artwork and stuff like that. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm really pressed for time because I'm doing so much work right now for Dope. Uh, and I mean, I'm literally like in a ton of videos for them and stuff, but um, you know, we'll see what happens. If I, if I can't reach my deadlines, I can't reach my deadlines. That's honestly the only really problem that I have with life right now is that I, I'm so busy. I, I'm happy, society once suffers. And it just, it's unfortunate because I love music and, and I love doing music, but you know, society one doesn't make the money that it used to. And I have to survive all the stuff that you see, all these guitars, the studio, all the equipment, all this stuff, it all has to get paid for somehow. And so does all the touring in our tour vehicles and, and whatever. And on top of it, man, you know, quite honestly, I'm, I'm older now. I'm, I just turned 47. I have a girlfriend, you know, and she's amazing. And we love to go travel and do things and have these amazing adventures together. And, you know, you have to make time for that too, or she, she's not going to be around. You know what I mean? Because what well, girl is going to put up with that. So she's very, very lenient in terms of her expectations and time, but you still have to spend, make time to spend time together. But there's only so much time in the day. And even though I only sleep six hours, maybe seven hours a night, you still got to sleep some, you, you, you know what I mean? And so uh, we'll see what happens. Black Level 6 will come out next year at some point. I just hope it's during this first tour and not the second tour. Uh, that's that's my only hope. But, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and uh, I think I've had you for about uh, 45 minutes now. Uh, is there anything that I didn't bring up uh, that you want to put out there? Um, yeah, I just want to say, I want to thank American Horrors, uh, the film festival that is going to be showing uh, Dirt's film, The Altered Noise, on the October 30th. It, you can buy tickets to it still, um, AmericanHorrors.com. Dirt would have absolutely loved the fact that his movie's being shown in a real movie theater up on the screen for a horror film festival because he loved horror films. So that is just an amazing, amazing thing. I just, I ask everybody to watch the movie. It's for free. It's up on YouTube to uh, please go check it out. Uh, it's a great film. I think everybody would really, really love it to watch it and, and enjoy it. And uh, besides that, um, please just go to our website, societyoneband.com and support us by buying some amazing merch. We've got things like no other band ever has. We have Black Level 6 soap and we've got, and we've got uh, uh, everything from jewelry to rings to shirts to the whole bit. So if you enjoy what I do and what the band does um, and what Dirt did, uh, watch the movie and you know support the band by uh, grabbing some merch and come see us on tour starting uh, February 19th of next year when we go out to tour with uh, Static X, Fear Factory, and Dope. Yeah, and I'll uh, throw a link to the Altered Noise in the uh, bio on the YouTube version of this too. Great. All right, uh, thanks again for your time today, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.